Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's ACE TA Center webinar. I'm Lisa Liu, the ACE TA Center Project Director and a Senior Consultant here at JSI. We are so excited to be launching our first webinar on Medicare coverage. Today, we will be focusing on the basics of Medicare for Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients, including Medicare eligibility pathways for people with HIV, what the different parts of Medicare cover, the enrollment process, dual eligibility, Medicare prescription drug coverage for people with HIV, and how the Ryan White program can help clients pay for Medicare costs. So here is a roadmap for what you can expect during today's session. First, we will review the changing demographics of the Ryan White program clients. And then we will discuss the Medicare eligibility pathways for people with HIV, followed by a breakdown of the different parts of Medicare, um, A, B, C, and D. After that, we'll talk about Medicare prescription drug coverage for people with HIV, and finally, the Medicare enrollment process and common enrollment challenges for Ryan White programs. We'll introduce several ACE TA Center resources throughout the presentation that you can access after the webinar, and we'll end with a Q&A session. Lisa, this is Elizabeth. Can I pause you here for a second? Sure. Sorry. We're having um, a hard time seeing your full screen. You may need to, um, if you're, you may need to change your, um, your monitor settings. Okay. It's cutting, off, it's cutting, it's cutting off the presentation. Hmm. If you're on a widescreen monitor. Okay. Thanks. Let me just troubleshoot this for a second. Is this better? That is better, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, just hold on everyone while I make a quick change. Okay, so today um, I have joining me to present Elizabeth uh, Costello and Ann Callahan. Elizabeth is the ACE TA Center Communications Manager and a Senior Consultant here at JSI. She has over 14 years of experience in strategic communications, digital media, and web-based training and technical assistance, and she has helped to develop the new Medicare tools that we'll be sharing later in this presentation. Anne is joining us from Community Research Initiative in Boston, Massachusetts. She is a staff member of the Massachusetts ADAP program, which is called HDAP. Uh, for HIV drug assistance program. Anne is the team lead for their Bridge Health Insurance Enrollment Team, which stands for Benefits, Resources, Infectious Disease Guidance, and Engagement. In coordination with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the Bridge team assists people with HIV in navigating insurance enrollment and supporting access to infectious disease drug assistance and preventing gaps in treatment and care. Anne has completed a Medicare training program and serves as a certified SHINE counselor and SHINE is also known as SHIP, or the State Health Insurance Assistance Program in most states in the country. So thanks for joining us today, Anne. We also have with us Mira Levinson, the ACA Center Principal and Investigator from JSI, Amy Killalay from NASDAD, and Rochelle Brill from Community Catalyst to uh, join us for uh, answering your questions at the end of today's webinar. So first, let's start out with a poll. Um, we just want to learn a little bit about uh, your clients and Medicare enrollment at your organization. So has your organization seen an increase in the number of clients who are aging into Medicare? So you can please answer the question now on your screen. Great. So lots of answers coming in. But about 70% of you are saying yes, that your organization has seen an increase in the number of clients aging into Medicare. So um, that is 
what we expected, and we hope that the information that we're sharing today will um, be helpful to you in terms of helping enroll your clients in Medicare and keep them enrolled um, in this coverage. So I wanna get started uh, by looking at the changing demographics of Ryan White program clients. So historically, uh, most Medicare beneficiaries living with HIV have been under the age of 65 and qualified for Medicare because of a disability. However, as many of you probably know, there are now more older adults living with HIV and served by the Ryan White program more than ever before. Medicare is the largest source of federal funding for HIV AIDS care in the US and about one quarter of people with HIV who are in care get their health coverage through Medicare. In 2018, 46% of Ryan White program clients were aged 50 years and older, and this is projected to rise to two thirds by 2030. So let's take a closer look at the data. It probably won't surprise most of you to see that the age distribution is shifting among Ryan White program clients, and the proportion of people with HIV aged 50 years and older in the Ryan White program is growing. So the graph on the left shows data from 2010, and the chart on the right shows data from 2018. And as you can see, the percentage of Ryan White program clients aged 35 to 50 years decreased from 2010 to 2018. So the blue and green bars show people aged 35 to 44 and 45 to 50 years old. And you can see that both the blue and green bars get shorter for 2018. The combined proportion of people in these groups decreased from nearly 60% in 2010 to just over 46% in 2018. So next, let's look at the orange and yellow bars. The percentage of Ryan White clients age 55 and older increased from just under 17% in 2010 to over 31% in 2018. And so a bit more here, let's take a look at the characteristics of people with HIV who are enrolled in Medicare. Remember not, that not all these people are Ryan White clients, and also there's a lot of people that have been part of the Medicare program for many years for reasons other than age. So the chart on the top shows how current Medicare beneficiaries with HIV first became eligible for Medicare. As you can see, 79% of Medicare beneficiaries with HIV are under age 65 and qualify due to disability. It's interesting to note that this is from the general population where only beneficiaries qualified based on disability. The other 21% of Medicare beneficiaries with HIV qualified based on age alone. A legal resident for at least five years with some exceptions. There are three primary ways that people with HIV may qualify for Medicare. Being at least 65 years old, being under 65 with a qualifying disability, or having end-stage renal disease. So CMS has a calculator you can use with your clients to determine Medicare eligibility, and we're chatting out the link to that now. And I'm going to talk about a, more, a bit more in detail about the first two pathways that I um, listed here. So as I just noted, any US citizen or eligible legal resident qualifies for Medicare when they turn 65. And we'll go into the different parts of Medicare soon, but in order to qualify for Medicare Part A hospital services without paying a monthly premium, individuals must have at least 40 quarters of social security work credits. People earn work credits while working in a job and paying social security taxes. Work credits are based on your total yearly wages or self-employment income. And generally, individuals earn up to four credits each year, so the amount needed for work credit does change from year to year. So 40 quarters or credits equals about 10 years worth of work. Certain people under the age of 65 are eligible for Medicare if they have 
a medical condition that meets the Social Security Requirements for Disability Insurance, or SSDI, and have worked in jobs covered by Social Security. After someone receives SSDI payments for at least 24 months, they're automatically eligible for Medicare Parts A and D. To qualify for premium free Medicare Part A hospital services, the person must also have 40 Social Security work credits, which is the same rule we just covered for people age 65 or older. And generally, to qualify for SSDI, Social Security requires that a person's disability be se severe enough to prevent them from doing any sort of substantial gainful employment for at least a year or more. So while HIV is one of the medical conditions that Social Security considers for disability, HIV status alone generally does not qualify someone for SSDI. A person may qualify when they have either a serious HIV-related condition, a qualifying CD, uh, CD4 count, repeated hospitalizations, or repeated manifestations of HIV that result in functional limitations. A person with HIV who does not qualify for SSDI under the HIV rules can still qualify by meeting the medical requirements for another physical or mental condition. So let's take uh, a quick break before we move on to the next, next section and find out about challenges. What is the top challenge at your organization for supporting Medicare enrollment and coverage? Is it understanding the different parts of Medicare, assisting clients with Medicare enrollment, assisting, client, assisting clients who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, knowing where to refer clients for external Medicare enrollment support, or other, and you can just chat in your response. Just give you everyone a few moments here to respond. But it looks like some of the leading challenges are understanding the different parts of Medicare, it's about almost 40% of you. And the next running up challenge is assisting clients who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid at 20%. So we can end that poll and show you all. So as you can see, about 40% of you said that understanding the different parts of Medicare um, is the top challenge with assisting clients who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid as kind of the runner up with some others close behind. So I think the information that we're about to share will be really helpful. And we also have resources that um, uh, include much of the information that we're going to be sharing on the webinar today that we'll be um, sending you the link for at the end of the webinar. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Elizabeth uh, to cover the fundamental parts of Medicare. Elizabeth? Thanks for that overview, Lisa, and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Um, so as you all just noted on that poll, the top challenge is understanding the different parts of Medicare. We're actually going to start right with that. We're going to start with those parts of Medicare. So um, there are four parts of Medicare, and Lisa mentioned, um, mentioned one of them just now, Medicare Part A. So Medicare Part A is hospital coverage. This, is, this covers inpatient hospital care, surgery, lab tests, hospice care, um, home health care, among other things. And then Medicare Part B, which is medical coverage, that includes services from doctors and other health care providers, including outpatient care and some preventative services. So Medicare Part B also covers medications that are administered by a physician and durable medical equipment. So we're chatting out some links right now with a bit more info on what Medicare Parts A and B cover. And again, those are for hospital and medical services. There's also Medicare Part D, and that provides coverage for outpatient prescription drugs. And that's where the, um, that includes HIV, antiretroviral, antiretroviral medications. And you'll notice on this slide, we actually, I skipped over Medicare Part C. Um, we'll get to that one in just a moment. Um, but even though there are these four different parts to Medicare, um, clients will only enroll in one of two ways. So the first main Medicare enrollment option is through Original Medicare. So Original Medicare includes part, part Medicare Part A, that's hospital coverage, and Part B, medical coverage. And some people call this 
traditional, they might refer to this as traditional Medicare. So original Medicare, it does not include um, prescription drug coverage. So that, that's something that people must purchase as a supplemental Part D, prescription drug coverage plan, which we'll talk a bit more, we'll talk about throughout this, this session. So those original Medicare plans, those are administered by the federal government. And um, clients can also enroll in Medicare through a Medicare Advantage plan. So these are plans that bundle the Part A hospital coverage, the Part B medical coverage, and the Part D prescription drug coverage. And Medicare Advantage is also known as Medicare Part C. So it's, we call that Part C, but it's actually, Part C is actually bundling Parts A, B, and D. So unlike original Medicare, these Medicare Advantage plans are administered by private insurance companies that are contracting with the federal government. And the plans are generally either an HMO or a PPO plan with a, a specific network of preferred providers. Um, enrollees may need to get some services approved ahead of time or get a referral to see a specialist. That's one difference from the original Medicare. Um, and also these plans may or may not have a monthly premium um, and which your ADAP may also be able to help pay for. So in addition to bundling, again, that hospital medical and prescription drug coverage plan, some Medicare Advantage plans um, may offer um, other benefits that original Medicare plans don't, such as vision or dental services. Now, many Ryan White programs are, recommend actually that clients enroll in original Medicare, um, though this decision is gonna very much depend on the, um, the Medicare Advantage plans that are available in your, in your jurisdiction. So it's very important to review those plans um, to determine, compare them to original Medicare and determine if they're a good option for your clients. Um, and Anne's going to speak to this more shortly in her presentation. So on this slide, I'm transitioning back to talking about original Medicare. Um, and while original Medicare pays for most of the covered services and supplies, um, there are also supplemental insurance plans that are known as um, Medigap policies. Um, that covers some costs of Medicare Part A um, and B coverage. Again, Part A is the hospital and Part B is the medical coverage. It might, these, these Medigap plans can help cover some of the co-pays and deductibles. So these are policies that are sold by private companies, um, but they're standardized by state and federal law, and they must be clearly identified to consumers as Medicare um, supplemental insurance. So a person must have um, Medic original Medicare, so again, parts A and B, to enroll in a Medigap policy. And you can't enroll in a Medigap policy if you're also enrolled in a Medicare Advantage so plan, so that's an either or. Um, and it should be noted that these Medigap policies do not cover costs for Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage, so none of those co-pays or deductibles or coinsurance. So let's look at the, let's compare these um, by cost a bit and coverage, um, looking at original Medicare first. So as Lisa mentioned earlier, most people do not pay a premium for Medicare Part A hospital coverage. Um, again, as long as they have sufficient work credits to qualify for, quote, premium-free Part A. You'll hear that phrase a lot, premium-free Part A. Um, and this, this, um, this requirement, um, or sorry, the, the premium free Part A, that applies to both people who qualify for Medicare due to age or disability. So someone who doesn't qualify for premium free Part A, they can still, be, because they don't have enough work credits, um, they can still pay a monthly premium for, to get um, Part A coverage, and that's gonna, that monthly premium cost is gonna be dependent on how many work credits they have, how close they are to that 40 credit um, requirement. And then everyone, anyone with original Medicare is going to be paying a monthly premium for Medicare Part B medical coverage that's going to be based on their income. And that's, so Medicare Part B is not tied to work credits like Medicare Part A is. So in 2020, the standard Part D premium was um, close to $145 per month, um, and that's for individuals who earn $87,000 per year or less. So if, if someone, anyone with a higher income that's enrolled 
in Medicare Part B, they're actually going to pay a higher monthly premium um, that's going to be um, based on, you know, based on their income levels. And for that part, for those Part B um, covered medical services, enrollees usually pay roughly 20% of the Medicare approved amount after they meet their deductible. So that's where those supplemental Medigap policies that I just mentioned on the previous slide come in. They can help pay for some of those, those extra costs. And there's no annual limit um, for what you pay out of pocket in original Medicare. Now, if someone doesn't sign up for Medicare Part B, when they're first eligible, they may have to pay a late enrollment penalty for each monthly premium for as long as they have Part B coverage. And we're going to talk about this um, penalty again later in the session. Um, part, the, the Part D prescription drug coverage, those plans also require um, a separate monthly premium when you are enrolled through, um, when you have that via original Medicare. So now let's look at the um, Medicare Advantage plan. As I mentioned earlier, these plans may or may not have um, may or may not have a monthly premium, um, and the plans do have a yearly limit on the out-of-pocket costs for um, covered services for parts A and B. Um, and again, you, as I said earlier, you cannot buy or use a supplemental Medigap policy with these plans. Um, but some of them, some of the plans may have lower out-of-pocket costs than Original Medicare. And the Ryan White program, including ADAP. Um, it may be able to help pay, help pay in full or in part for Medicare premiums, deductibles, and copayments. And again, it's really important to compare plans, um, you know, comparing the original Medicare versus the Medicare Advantage to see which will be best for your client um, and to check with your local ADAP to determine um, how it may be able to help with costs. So we're going to check out, we're going to chat out the link for the NASDAQ ADAP directory now to help you contact your local ADAP. So one of the other um, one of the other um, challenges we noted that we've noted on the slide earlier or the poll earlier was around dual eligibility for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and as Lisa mentioned earlier, we have close to 70% of Medicare enrollees with HIV are duly eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And for these dual eligible beneficiaries, Medicare is going to pay for covered medical services before Medicaid though Medicaid can cover some medical costs that Medicare may um, only partially cover or not cover at all. And then, of course, for, for Ryan White program clients, um, the Ryan White program will continue to be the payer of last resort um, and will continue after Medicare and Medicaid um, or with Medicare and Medicaid and will continue to pay for Ryan White program services that are not covered or partially covered by um, by Medicaid. And many um, dual eligible clients, they also qualify for extra help paying for the Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage um, if they are eligible for a low income subsidy. And this is through something called the, the extra help program. So let's dig into prescription drug coverage a bit more specifically for people with HIV. So as we've noted, there are two ways to get Medicare prescription drug coverage, either by purchasing an optional Medicare Part D plan um, after you've enrolled in original Medicare Parts A and B, or by enrolling in a, um, in a Medicare Advantage plan that bundles the prescription drug coverage along with that Part A and Part B hospital and medical coverage. So all prescription, uh, Medicare prescription drug plans must provide a standard level of coverage set by Medicare. But the, the, the plans can and offer different combinations of coverage and cost sharing. And Medicare drug plans, they, they also may differ in, in the prescription drugs they cover, how much individuals have to pay, and which pharmacies they can use. All prescription drug plans are required to cover all or nearly all drugs in six protected drug classes, and that includes the antiretroviral treatments for HIV. And HIV drugs are required to be covered without any utilization management, such as prior authorization or step therapy. So if you're not familiar with those terms, um, prior authorization is 
is requiring coverage and utilization review before prescribing a preferred drug regimen. And then step therapy is starting patients on a less expense on less on less expensive treatment regimens and then requiring them to fail on those options um, in order to get um, access to the prescriber's preferred or recommended regimen. So similar to the Part B late enrollment penalty that I mentioned, um, there's also a late enrollment penalty for people who choose not to enroll um, in prescription drug coverage when they are first eligible, and that's at any age, whether you're qualifying by disability or at age 65. And this penalty is in addition to their monthly premium for um, as long as they have a Medicare drug plan. Though over time, the Part D penalty um, is significantly smaller than the Part B penalty, late enrollment penalty. The exception to the Part B late enrollment penalty is for people that already have other creditable prescription drug coverage when they apply for Medicare. Um, and this is often through an employer-sponsored um, employer plan. So these people that have the employer coverage, they can generally keep that coverage without paying a penalty if they decide to enroll in a Part D prescription drug coverage plan later. So other other creditable prescription drug coverage, that is coverage that provides at least as much as Medicare's standard prescription drug coverage. So ADAP, for example, is not considered creditable prescription drug coverage because it doesn't meet that, that qualification of, of providing the same coverage as Medicare. Now, clients have questions about whether their current prescription drug coverage is considered, quote, credi creditable or not. They should speak to someone at, the, at Social Security, um, Medicare, or their employer's human resources department to explore that. So you may have heard about the Medicare donut hole, um, or this is the coverage gap for prescription drug coverage. And this donut hole refers to the gap when a Medicare beneficiary's initial Medicare prescription drug coverage has ended, but they do not yet qualify for catastrophic coverage. So you enter the donut hole when your total drug costs, and that includes um, that includes what you and your plan, both you and your plan have paid for your drugs when that reaches um, a certain limit. So that's the second box on this screen or on this on this graphic. So in 2020, the limit that limit is four thousand twenty dollars. So, so once you hit that amount, then you, you are in the donut hole. That's the, the circle with the orange bar at the bottom. Um, when someone is in that donut hole, the amount that they are paying for prescription drugs will be higher until they have met the limit for, um, for true out-of-pocket costs, which is $6,350 in 2020. So again, once you've hit that limit, now you've reached had the catastrophic coverage threshold. That's the fourth box in this graphic. And that's when you begin to pay significantly lower costs for the remainder of the year. And this process resets again in the following year. Um, so it resets back to zero. And we just want to note that ADAP expenditures for clients that have Medicare Part D coverage, those do count towards their true out-of-pocket costs. Um, so this is going to help clients reach that catastrophic coverage level faster. So again, you should, you should um, we encourage you to check with your local ADAP about how they can help um, clients pay for drug coverage, especially when they're in this this coverage gap. So I'm now going to turn it over to Anne to talk about her experience in Massachusetts with counseling clients on enrolling in original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage coverage. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar today. Um, so I'm going to go over some of my own experiences working with clients in Massachusetts. So counseling individuals about the pros and cons of original Medicare and adding an optional Medigap plan versus a Medicare Advantage plan is complicated and may vary from state to state. Some ADAP programs may be able to cover the monthly premiums for a Medigap 
plan or Medicare Advantage plan, some may not. Understanding what Medicare plans your state's ADAP can pay and what a Ryan White program client would be responsible for themselves is vital in assisting these clients to make the choices that are best for them. Clients who opt for original Medicare only without enrolling in a Medigap plan should be carefully counseled about the coverage gaps in original Medicare, including deductibles and coinsurance. Beneficiaries choosing original Medicare should also be encouraged to enroll in Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage and your state may require them to enroll in this coverage. A Medicare beneficiary only needs Medicare Part A or Part B to enroll in a Part D plan, but all Medicare beneficiaries should be encouraged to enroll in both A and B during their initial enrollment period unless they have active employer-sponsored insurance through their own or their spouse's employer that allows them to defer this enrollment and avoid gaps in coverage and late enrollment penalties later. Beneficiaries who are eligible for the Federal Extra Health Low Income Subsidy Program are eligible for a premium-free Medicare prescription drug plan. Those who are not have a monthly premium for their Part D plan. Most, if not all, ADEP programs can pay this premium for clients who are active in their program. The Medicare.gov website allows beneficiaries to shop for and compare Part D plans and find the plans that cover most of all of their most or all of their medications with the least number of restrictions. The restrictions include things like medication not on formulary and quantity limit issues. Providers can generally work with a Part D plan insurance carrier to request a prior authorization or exception that overrides these restrictions. The current Part A deductible is $1,408 and is based on a 90-day benefit period, meaning a beneficiary could face this deductible more than once a year if they have multiple hospitalizations. Once the Part A deductible is met, beneficiaries could face additional charges for hospitalizations that exceed 60 days, skilled nursing care that exceeds 20 days, and blood products in excess of three pints. The current Part B deductible is $198 and is an annual deductible. After the Part B deductible is met, Medicare will pay 80% of Medicare approved charges and a beneficiary will be responsible for the remaining 20%. A beneficiary must have both a and B to enroll in a Medigap plan. Medigap beneficiaries pay a monthly premium that determines exactly what their out-of-pocket costs will be, if any. The more expensive the plan, the greater the benefits. Paying more now limits a client's out-of-pocket expenses um, to, zero, to possibly zero dollars. Medigap plans may be a better option for clients with more complex medical needs. These plans may also be a better choice for clients who travel during the year, as any provider who accepts Medicare should also accept a client's Medigap plan. In Massachusetts, there are three Medigap plan options that vary in price and benefits. Your state could have more or less. Beneficiaries shopping for Medicare Advantage plans may not be able to find a plan that works with all of their providers and could face higher out-of-pocket costs to see an out-of-network provider or one in another state. 
all plans have co-pays and co-insurances that a beneficiary is responsible for. These costs are usually higher for individuals enrolled in zero or low premium plans. The Medicare.gov website allows beneficiaries to compare Advantage plans to find the plan that works best for them with the least number of restrictions. Like Part D plans, these restrictions include medication not a formulary or quantity limit issues that would require provider outreach to get a prior authorization or exception. Medicare Advantage plans may be a better option for clients with less complex medical needs and those who do not tr often travel outside their state. Costs for high-level care and hospitalizations can add up. The current Medicare prescription drug coverage gap as, as covered before is, is $63.50. In Massachusetts, our HAP, HIV Drug Assistance Program, can cover medication copays for active program clients even when they are in the coverage gap. Understanding the donut hole is complicated. Making sure your active ADAP clients are covered by your program while in the donut hole is important in helping them to select the plan that works best for them. Some Medicare prescription drug plans, both Part D and Part D, may have an annual drug deductible. Understanding if your program can cover a client's drug deductible is another important factor in assisting your clients to enroll in the best coverage possible. I am going to turn it back over to Elizabeth now to discuss the Medicare enrollment process. Thank you, Anne. Um, so we've talked about what Medicare covers and we've compared the different options. So now we're going to talk about how clients who are aging into Medicare, um, how they will enroll in Medicare and some of the common challenges that they may face. So there are four primary pathways that, um, primary ways that people who are aging into Medicare um, may enroll in either original Medicare or um, a Medicare Advantage plan. So first, um, anyone who claims Social Security benefits um, before the age of 65, they will be automatically enrolled in Medicare Parts A and B um, when they are eligible for Medicare at age 65 at their, on their birthday. And actually, in this, in this case, their Medicare card will come in the mail three months before their 65th birthday so they don't have to do anything else to enroll. Um, and as a reminder, the, the earliest that someone can start receiving Social Security retirement benefits is age 62. So for people who are about to turn 65, but they've not started to receive, um, they've not elected to receive Social Security retirement benefits yet, they can enroll in Medicare during their initial enrollment period. Other people may turn 65, but they'll, they might still be covered by their employer coverage if, if they are a spouse or someone else um, in their household is still working. So when they are ready to transition off of employer coverage after the age of 65, um, they, can, they qualify for a special enrollment period for Medicare. And finally, there is a general enrollment period for people who did not enroll during their initial enrollment period when they turn 65, and who also don't qualify for a special um, enrollment period, you know, because they didn't have in, in, they didn't have employer coverage. So we'll talk about each of these enrollment periods in more detail now. So again, that the Medicare initial enrollment period, or um, sometimes we refer to that just as the IEP, that is a seven-month period that starts three months before someone turns 65 and then includes the months that they turn 65 and ends three months after they turn 65. So if someone signs up for Medicare during the first three months of their IEP, um, in most cases their coverage will start the first day of the month that they turn 65. 
And if they enroll in, in Medicare the month they turn 65 or three months after, so that the, the second half um, of that IEP, um, their coverage start date will be a bit delayed. So we really want to reiterate and stress how important this initial enrollment period is for clients who are aging into Medicare and don't have employer-sponsored coverage. So I mentioned the Medicare Part B, that late enrollment penalty earlier. So people who do not sign up for Medicare um, Part B medical coverage, either through original Medicare or through a bundled Medicare Advantage plan, if they don't enroll when they're first eligible, um, they will be subject to a late enrollment surcharge. And this surcharge or penalty is equal to 10% of the standard Part B premium for each of the 12, each 12 months of the delay. So the longer someone delays, that, um, that late, late enrollment surcharge can increase. And this is a lifetime of increased cost. This is a penalty that continues for as long as you have Medicare Part B coverage. And as I mentioned earlier, there is also a late enrollment penalty for Part D um, prescription drug coverage, but that is significantly smaller than the Part B penalty. So it's really important to counsel your clients to enroll and, and support them um, to enroll in Medicare Part B when they first become eligible to avoid this ongoing penalty. So clients that have employer coverage are not required to sign up for Medicare at age 65 during that initial enrollment period. Um, and in this case, they don't need to do anything proactively um, to defer their Medicare enrollment as long as they're still covered by an employer plan. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about when they enroll now. So there is a special enrollment period for people who are transferring um, from employer-sponsored coverage to Medicare coverage after the age of 65. Now, some people may have employer coverage um, through their own coverage or through a spouse. Um, and when that employer coverage ends, they have eight months to apply for Medicare. And the coverage begins the first month after they enroll. So I want to note that COBRA health plans um, are not considered coverage based on current em employment. And someone who transitions from, if someone transitioned from a employer plan to COBRA, that would, they would not be el then eligible for Medicare, Medicare um, special enrollment period when their COBRA ends. So, you know, really people should be going from employer coverage to Medicare if they're beyond the age of 65. And I also want to note that even if someone has employer coverage, they can still enroll in that um, Medicare Part A hospital coverage if they are eligible for the, for the premium-free Part A. There's no penalty or reason why you wouldn't need to do that. You can do that when you turn 65 and, and have both and be covered by both um, the the Medicare Part A and your employer coverage. And remember, we talked about how people with um, 40 work credits, or which is approximately 10 years of work history, um, they're, they're eligible for that premium free Part A. And they can also check in with their employer, um, their human resources department to make sure there aren't any um, issues with being enrolled in, in both of those. Now, finally, for individuals who miss their initial enrollment period if they don't enroll in the seven months around their birthday their 65th birthday um, and that do not qualify for a medicare special enrollment period they can enroll um, their options for is to enroll during the general enrollment period um, now of the of these different enrollment periods that we're covering um, this is the only one that's tied to annually to, to the same calendar um, dates um, similar to marketplace enrollment, um, marketplace enrollment, which has, you know, annual dates. So the general enrollment period for Medicare, that runs from January 1st to March 31st annually. So someone who's enrolling during the general enrollment period, at the beginning of the year, um, their coverage will not actually start until July 1st of that year. So they're going to have a coverage gap um, of, of April, May, and June. Um, and of course, these individuals may, um, they may have to pay um, 
a Medicare Part A premium if they don't qualify for the premium-free Part A um, based on work credits. And they may also have to pay that late enrollment penalty um, in addition to their monthly Part B premium because they didn't, um, did not enroll when they were first eligible. Now, another note is that you cannot enroll in Medicare Part D during this general enrollment period. Um, so when, that, when the Medicare A and B coverage starts in July, um, then, then they can enroll in the optional uh, Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage. So I just mentioned the marketplace briefly. Um, and um, similar to COBRA coverage, Having marketplace coverage past the age of 65 also does not qualify someone for a Medicare special enrollment period. So um, again, that's only for employer coverage. So people who are enrolled in a marketplace plan um, at age 64, they should enroll in Medicare during their initial enrollment period as well to avoid, avoid those, those late enrollment penalties. And um, people are not People who have marketplace coverage, they are not automatically terminated from their marketplace plans um, once they enroll in Medicare. They may get a notice from the health insurance marketplace that says they, they may soon be eligible for Medicare um, and can change their marketplace plan. But they, you know, clients definitely should not be waiting for this notice. If it, you know, in case it doesn't come or in case they miss it, um, they should actively terminate their um, their plan once they have their marketplace plan once they've enrolled in Medicare. Um, and also once someone has Medicare Part A coverage, once that coverage starts, they wouldn't be eligible for any premium tax credits or any other savings from a marketplace plan. So and if you if you kept your market so then and therefore in that scenario if you kept a marketplace plan you have to be paying full price for it. So for this reason in most cases you'll want to someone end your marketplace coverage again once you're eligible for Medicare and don't wait for that notice um, to, and be sure to sign up for, for Medicare once you're eligible at 65. And healthcare.gov includes a, a questionnaire, um, a web-based questionnaire with step-by-step um, -step instructions for canceling um, your marketplace plan when, tra tra when transitioning to Medicare. And so we'll go ahead and chat that link out for that now. All right, let's pause for two knowledge checks on what we've just learned about the Medicare enrollment process. So first we're gonna look at Keith. Keith is turning 65 in July and he is currently enrolled in marketplace coverage. So what should, in this scenario, what should Keith do? Um, should he A, keep his marketplace coverage through the end of 2020 and enroll in Medicare during the general enrollment period? which starts in January 2021? Should he be enroll in Medicare during the initial enrollment period around his birthday and then proactively cancel his marketplace plan? Or should he see um, enroll in Medicare through a special enrollment period after his birthday? All right. So a lot of responses coming in. It looks like the majority of you have selected um, option B, which is, that's right. Um, you know, we want to avoid to avoid a late enrollment penalty. In this scenario, um, Keith would want to enroll in Medicare during his initial enrollment period and then cancel his marketplace plan after his Medicare coverage begins so he doesn't, um, doesn't pay those, those Part B penalties. So in this next knowledge check, um, let's look at Sandra. Um, if you don't see the new knowledge check pop up, you might have to close the, the, the one right before it. Um, so Sandra um, missed her initial enrollment period and she does not qualify for a special enrollment period because she doesn't have employer coverage. So she's gonna wait till, she needs to wait till the general enrollment period um, next January to enroll. So based on that, when will her coverage start for Medicare? Well, let's start on February, one month after she enrolls. We'll start in April at the end of the special enrollment or the general enrollment period. 
um, or start in July, six months after she enrolls. So I'll give you all a moment to answer this poll. All right, so the correct answer here is C, um, July. So anyone who enrolls through the annual um, general enrollment period, so that's January through March, their coverage will not start until the following July. And you know, we this means that they have, again, they have a coverage gap um, between when they enroll and when their when their coverage begins. Um, so this is another reason why we really want to encourage people to um, enroll in that initial enrollment period if they're eligible or the special enrollment period if they're eligible for that so they don't get stuck in that um, in that gap when they don't have coverage. All right, so we've seen how it can be pretty confusing to understand the different parts of Medicare and all the different ways to enroll. Um, so there are several things that you can do to help support your Ryan White program clients as they enroll in Medicare. So to, one thing you can do is to proactively identify clients that are aging into Medicare um, and help them avoid those late enrollment penalties. Um, some strategies are you can create automated, auto, automated reminders in Careware or ask your uh, medical case managers to flag clients as they're approaching their 65th birthday and start to have that conversation about um, that, you know, the initial enrollment period and what steps you need to take to make sure you're covered during that time. Um, and another strategy is to support, you know, we always, we always recommend one-on-one -on -one enrollment assistance for marketplace coverage, and it's the same recommendation here for Medicare, um, providing, you know, to help support one-on-one -on -one Medicare enrollment assistance you can refer your clients to your um, state health insurance assistance program or SHIP. So we've mentioned those earlier um, and is working with a SHIP. So SHIPs provide free local insurance counseling and assistance to Medicare eligible individuals and their families and their caregivers. Um, this, this, this program may have a different name in your state, um, but we're gonna chat out the link to the SHIP locator now. And you can also consider having a staff person trained as a SHIP counselor, which is what Anne did. So again, I'm gonna turn it over to her now to share her experiences as a, sh as a, as a um, counselor in Massachusetts. Thank you, Elizabeth. So the Massachusetts SHINE program provides free health insurance counseling, information, and assistance to Massachusetts residents with Medicare, their caregivers, and those approaching Medicare eligibility. I learned about the SHINE certification training program during the 2018 Medicare open enrollment period after referring a complicated Medicare client to SHINE. In April of 2019, I completed the 50-hour training program. As a SHINE counselor, I am better equipped to assist HIV-positive Massachusetts residents who are aging into Medicare and those already enrolled in Medicare navigate the complexities of this coverage, including enrollment into the different parts of Medicare. While the primary focus of this training was Medicare, I also learned a lot about our state's Medicaid program and some other state programs that I did not know about, which has helped me immeasurably in, in helping Massachusetts HIV clients. Your state may have a similar program named SHIP. I would encourage anybody working with Ryan White program clients to consider completing a Medicare training program if they are given the opportunity to do so. As more and more Ryan White program clients age into Medicare, I think it's ideal to have Ryan White program staff trained as SHIP or Medicare counselors so they better understand the complexities of Medicare, how Medicare works with their program requirements um, and the coverage needs of people living with HIV. 
In this next group of slides, I'll review some common Medicare enrollment challenges. The first is making sure Ryan White program clients enroll in Medicare A and B when they first become eligible unless they have a legitimate reason like employer-sponsored insurance to defer this enrollment. Beneficiaries who do not enroll in Medicare Part B during their initial enrollment period will likely face a 10% late enrollment penalty that increases year after year. These individuals will generally need to wait until the Medicare general enrollment period to enroll in coverage that begins on July 1st. The general enrollment period is every year from January 1st to March 31st. Um, but there is a lengthy gap in coverage um, depending upon the time of year. Contacting the Social Security Administration to understand the implications of deferring enrollment into Part A and or B is highly recommended. Part D enrollment deferral is another thing to consider, but it is easier to resolve and the penalty is significantly smaller. To, as I believe we've covered this already, but to defer Part D enrollment without a penalty, beneficiaries must have prescription drug coverage at least as good as Medicare's and should qualify for a special enrollment period when this coverage ends. Beneficiaries without other prescription drug coverage or coverage as good as Medicare's could face a 1% penalty and may need to wait until the Medicare open enrollment period, leaving them without prescription drug coverage. Beneficiaries who became Medicare eligible prior to age 65 due to a disability who are paying a late enrollment penalty because they didn't enroll when they were first eligible should be able to have this penalty reset when they turn 65. The second common challenge is making sure that Ryan White program clients who defer enrollment into Medicare A, B, or D during their initial enrollment period due to enrollment in employer-sponsored insurance work with their employer's HR department before making decisions about which coverage to defer. Clients on employer-sponsored insurance through their own or their spouse's employer can generally enroll into Part A and keep their employer-sponsored plan. For most individuals, Part A is premium free, so there is rarely a good reason not to enroll when they first become eligible. Encourage these clients to contact their HR department to confirm that their coverage meets the criteria for deferring enrollment into Part B and Part D and avoiding a penalty down the road. When in doubt, contact the Social Security Administration. Prior to retirement or employment termination, a Medicare beneficiary's employer will need to complete a Medicare enrollment form that the individual will need to return to Social Security Administration with their own enrollment form. These forms ensure that when employment ends, the beneficiary will be eligible for a special enrollment period that allows them to enroll in the parts of Medicare they are missing. Following these steps is important in making sure individuals avoid gaps in coverage and late enrollment penalties. A retiree plan or COBRA coverage does not protect an individual from a Part B late enrollment penalty, and in general, COBRA does not work well with Medicare. The third common challenge for Ryan White program clients involves Medicare and marketplace plans. Clients who are Medicare eligible will likely lose eligibility to enroll in or continue coverage in marketplace plans. Unfortunately, the marketplace is not always consistent 
in their outreach to members who are currently enrolled in marketplace coverage to let them know that their coverage will or has termed due to their Medicare eligibility. These communications may often be missed by clients who do not open or understand their mail when they do open it. Clients who are still within their Medicare initial enrollment period when their marketplace coverage terms should be able to enroll in Medicare, but may face a lapping, lapsing coverage of several months if they are in if they are still in the four month the last four months of their initial eligibility period during and after their birth month clients who learn about a loss of marketplace coverage after their seven month initial enrollment period ends can try to pursue medicare enrollment through a program called equitable relief but this program is very difficult to navigate, not well known about even within the Social Security Administration. Clients who lose marketplace coverage after their initial enrollment period ends may have to wait until the next general enrollment period and could face more than a year without coverage depending on when they learn about their loss of marketplace coverage. Generally, the only individuals age 65 and over who are eligible to enroll in or remain in marketplace coverage are those who do not qualify for premium free part A or for Medicare benefits in general due to their immigration status. Clients should be encouraged to outreach to or visit Social Security Administration to troubleshoot any problems related to Medicare eligibility in the marketplace. Individuals can make changes to their Medicare choices at different times after their initial enrollment period. During the Medicare open enrollment period, which runs from October 15th through December 7th, beneficiaries can enroll in or change their Medicare Part D or Medicare Advantage plans or enroll back into original Medicare with a Part D plan from a Medicare Advantage plan. A small percent of our Massachusetts clients may want to discuss or make these changes during the Medicare open enrollment period. We also assist a large number of clients during this time who have lost their dual eligibility for Medicare and Medicaid or their coverage for the marketplace when they turn 65. Um, with Medicare enrollments, including Part D and a Medigap plan or Medicare Advantage plan enrollment. During the Medicare open enrollment period, January 1st to March 31st, beneficiaries can change from one Advantage plan to another or go back to original Medicare with a Part D plan. In my experience, the number of clients who want to make these changes during this time is very small. Throughout the year, our ADAP outreaches to clients who are aging into Medicare and assists them with these enrollments. We also assist clients who may be transitioning from employer-sponsored insurance due to their own or their spouse's retirement to enroll into the parts of Medicare they are missing, like Part B or Medicare prescription drug coverage, and review the pros and cons of original Medicare with and without a Medigap versus a Medicare Advantage plan. I am going to transition back to Liesl for some final slides. Great, thanks Anne so much. So as we've mentioned throughout, ACE has three resources to help you learn more about Medicare eligibility, enrollment, and coverage for Ryan White program clients and other people with HIV. We will chat out the links to these um, tools now on Target HIV, and much of what we covered today is in these tools. So the first one is the basics of Medicare for Ryan White program clients, and that covers the eligibility pathways, the different parts of Medicare, 
how to support Ryan White clients enrolling into Medicare and how the Ryan White program can help clients with Medicare related costs. The second is on Medicare prescription drug coverage for Ryan White program clients, and that goes over uh, prescription drug coverage for HIV medications, how the Ryan White program, including ADAP, can help clients pay for Medicare prescription drug coverage and the donut hole period for prescription drug coverage. And then finally, how Medicare enrollment works is the third fact sheet. And this goes over the different enrollment periods, how to avoid late enrollment penalties, as well as how clients can transition from marketplace coverage to Medicare and how to make changes to Medicare coverage. So these will be great um, reminders of all the information that we've covered today. Um, we have added Medicare to our scope at the ACA Center and we'll be releasing more tools this summer and planning for additional technical assistance to come in the coming years. So please let us know of your Medicare TA needs via the chat or by email at a later date. You can email us at uh, acetacenter at jsi.com. So some of you have probably heard of the CARES Act, which stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And we just want to talk about it for a few moments in terms of healthcare access for people living with HIV. The CARES Act was signed into law on March 27, 2020. And among other things, the CARES Act adds a couple of important new requirements for Medicare plans. First, the act now requires that Medicare Part D plans provide up to a 90-day, a three-month supply of covered Part D drugs to enrollees who request it. Some plans provided this flexibility in the past, but now it is a requirement. So if your clients have Medicare Part D and would like to request a 90-day supply of their medications, this option is now available to them. Second, Medicare and all group health insurance plans, including marketplace and off-marketplace plans, are now required to cover COVID-19 testing with cost sharing, such as deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. And many state Medicaid programs are also covering COVID-19 testing without cost sharing. And regarding insurance coverage, you should remind your clients that services are not, um, that are not related to testing may still be subject to insurance cost sharing. And also very important, sure, short team limited duration plans are not considered insurance and may not be subject to these requirements. And finally, uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration HIV AIDS Bureau continues to update its list of coronavirus 2019 frequently asked questions and resources for Ryan White program recipients, subrecipients, and stakeholders. I strongly encourage you to check that frequently and if you aren't on the list already, already definitely sign up for the HRSA HAB information email to make sure you're getting ready to go updates from HRSA. So we're chatting out the link um, to the email sign up now. And then next, I just wanted to talk about helping your clients stay covered. So some of your clients may be experiencing unexpected life events or special circumstances, including losing a job or experiencing income changes. It's important to remind your clients that they may be eligible for coverage through Marketplace, Medicaid, CHIP, and more. In addition, some of your clients may also be turning 65 and eligible for Medicare coverage. So options like COBRA are out there too, but COBRA can be expensive and not, may not be the best fit for their coverage needs. So it's important to look at all the options before deciding to use COBRA. For example, many life events and special circumstances create Marketplace Special Enrollment Periods, or SEPs, for example, people who lose employer-based health coverage because of losing or quitting their job are eligible for the loss of coverage SEP right now. So this SEP also applies for people who lose their employer coverage because their work hours have been reduced or because their employer is now contributing less or even nothing at all to so their premium amount. So the SEP applies, also applies when a spouse has lost their employer-based health coverage. It's important to remember also that Medicaid and CHIP enrollment is open throughout the year for newly eligible clients. And in Medicaid expansion states, some clients may be newly eligible for expanded Medicaid. And a number of states have created their own SEPs to promote access to private health insurance due to COVID-19, including California, Colorado, Washington, DC, Massachusetts, Maryland, Nevada, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington. Connecticut and Minnesota also had COVID-19 related SEPs, but they've just recently ended this week. Um, so we'd encourage you to stay up to date on those if you live in those states. 
Um, anyone can enroll or change their cover coverage with these SEPs, even if they have not experienced another qualifying life event. And depending on the state, the SEP may end in April, May, or June. To see the full list on what's happening in each state, um, you can check your state's marketplace, or we're chatting out a link to an interactive map from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And finally, remember that the Ryan White HIV AIDS program is not health insurance. The Ryan White program only covers HIV care and ADAPS can often help clients find affordable coverage for all their health needs. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mira to start addressing all of your questions that have been coming in. Mira? Thanks, Liesl, and hi, everyone. Yes, we have a lot of questions that have come in, so I will do my best to get us through as many as possible. And we will keep track of all of the questions that have come in to make sure that um, we're able to respond in some way. So um, why don't we start with um, a question for Amy Killaway. Uh, Amy, the question is about whether um, anyone has ever been able to successfully take over Medicare premium payments for a client whose premium comes out of a social security payment automatically. Um, and then asked in another way, does anyone have guidance on taking over Medicare premium payments for Ryan White clients, specifically for them to opt out of auto deduction from Social Security payments? Thanks, Mira, and hi, everyone. Um, so this, this came up quite a few times, and this has been a sort of perennial challenge for um, Ryan White programs. Um, you know, Medicare Part B premiums that are taken out of an individual Social Security payment are very challenging and most of the time impossible for a third party um, like ADAP uh, or Part B or another Ryan White part to pay um, uh, with, with very few exceptions. Uh, railroad retirees are, are one um, small subset um, where the, the uh, premium payments are administered differently, but for the most part those premium payments are being deducted from the Social Security check. Um, and uh, there is, there's not been a way uh, for Ryan White programs to coordinate with Social Security uh, to, to pay that um, uh, sort of at the, the front end. I will say we have, um, we've seen a handful of exceptions at um, uh, the local SSA office where the, the Ryan White program has been successful in sort of coordinating on the front end before Medicare was effective to pay those premiums um, on behalf of the client. Um, but I would say that is the exception, um, the fluke rather than the rule for the ma vast majority of clients. Um, this just is not a cost that, um, that Ryan White um, can pay, though, though I think that there continue to be sort of efforts and federal conversations to, to, to figure out a fix because it would be possible for Ryan White to pay the premiums. HRSA allows that. And I would just say, um, I would flag as a resource to the HRSA HAB uh, policy clarification notice 1802, um, which was uh, uh, which came out um, a few years ago now. Um, and that really um, uh, sort of clarified the allowable use of Ryan White funds across the Medicare parts. Um, and I will say for Medicare part B, um, you know, all Ryan White parts can, can pay premiums and or cost sharing um, in conjunction with paying for Medicare Part D premiums or cost sharing. So that's a, an important resource too when you're looking at what it is possible for Ryan White grantees to pay for Medicare. And Amy, can you just uh, tell me again which PCN you're referring to and then we'll look it up and chat it out? Sure thing. Um, that is PCN uh, 1802. And I'm sorry, let, let me make I, sure I've got this right. I believe it's PCN, okay. it's PCN 1801. I got my numbers confused, I'm very sorry. It is PCN 1801, um, and yes, <laughs> I think it would be great. Uh, too many numbers, uh, 1801, yes. <laughs> great, okay, we will chat that one out in just a few minutes while we uh, take some more questions. All right, so let me ask another question, and this time um, I'm gonna ask a question from Anne. So Anne, can you talk about the difference between a Medicare Advantage plan and supplemental policies? Um, sure, I can talk about that. I think we did touch a little bit about this in the slides, but it certainly is complicated. So um, Medicare Advantage plans would be a 
private insurance plan that sort of replaces a client's traditional original Medicare A and B. A client's claims no longer go through um, Medicare in any way. Medicare is paying that private insurance carrier to manage that client's benefits. And as a result, the um, client may or may not have a monthly premium for those plans. Um, and they will always have co-pays or co-insurance that sort of um, replaces the traditional um, gaps that people see in original Medicare, which would be A and B. So a supplement policy is for somebody who chooses to stick with the original Medicare A and B with those gaps in coverage um, and deductibles and pay a private insurance carrier um, to cover some or all of the gaps in their original Medicare A and B. But it is complicated. Thank you. Um, all right, one for you, Elizabeth. Can you explain, uh, someone wants to know, can a Part C take place of a Part D? And here we're talking about uh, Medicare Part C and Medicare Part D. Yes, thanks, Mira. So the Medicare Part C, um, that, that's the Medicare Advantage plan. So that automatically, by default, is bundling Parts A, B, and D together. So a client who has a, a Part C Medicare Advantage plan, um, they would not need to they would not need to enroll or be able to enroll in a separate um, Part D plan. The only 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 um, people who are enrolled in Original Medicare, which is just Parts A and B, need to enroll in a separate Part D plan. Great. Um, uh, Anne, can you explain uh, how to determine if Part C? has a premium or not, or what determines if a Part C has a premium or not? Um, certainly. It, it's really just when you search for the plans online, some of them are going to have monthly premiums, some of them are going to be um, $0 premium plans, but like everything in life, nothing is free. So generally, clients who enroll in Medicare Advantage plans with a $0 monthly premium are, or lower premiums are going to face higher out-of-pocket costs um, than those who opt into a plan with a higher premium. Great, um, I have a couple more questions for you and then I'm gonna ask Rochelle Brill to take a question. So the questions for you are first, um, someone wants to know, so Medigap plans are basically Advantage plans without Part D? Um, no, so it, Medigap plans would be Medicare supplement plans. So I, I, um, I, I think we, I, I, I feel like I already answered this, but maybe not. Um, so a Medigap plan would be for somebody who opts into original Medicare A and B and then separately purchases a plan through private insurance carrier that covers some or all of their gaps in coverage. And I got okay. a lot with the question there, <laughs> so sorry. Oh, no worries, no worries. Let's try one more. Okay. Um, if you elect Part C coverage, do you still have to pay for Part B? You do, you do. So um, in addition to potentially having a premium for the Medicare Advantage plans, people are still responsible for the Part B monthly premium that normally gets deducted from their social security income. Great, okay. Um, so uh, Rochelle Brill, we have a question for you. Um, someone's asking whether CARES Act stimulus payments count as income when applying for health insurance. And let's just clarify, we're talking about the CARES Act related to COVID-19 that was just passed, not to be confused with the Ryan White Care Act. So Rochelle, if you could take that one. 
Uh, you might be on mute. Hey, Mary, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. So the, the CARES Act stimulus payments, which are uh, $1,200 for an individual or $2,400 for a married couple, um, do not count as income for either Medicaid or um, marketplace coverage. The $600 bump in unemployment benefits, though, which was also um, written into the CARES Act, um, does not count as income for Medicaid co coverage, but does count as income for marketplace coverage. So in terms of um, eligibility, stimulus check does not count uh, for either Medicaid or marketplace, but the only difference is the $600 uh, bump in unemployment benefits does count as income for the marketplace, but does not count for Medicaid. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like we're getting really tight on time today with the most questions we've gotten on a webinar in quite a while. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just have um, folks answer one more question, and then uh, I'll hand it back to Liesl to wrap us up. So I think the last question we're going to take uh, right now is um, has to do with um, ADAP and the donut hole. Uh, Amy, can you take that one, whether it's considered to be troop? Yes. Yes. Um, and so uh, this is a good positive question to end on. Um, the, the answer is yes. As, as part of the ACA, um, ADAP payments made on behalf of a Medicare beneficiary count toward that beneficiary's um, true out-of-pocket cost or troop. Uh, and so those are the costs that um, allow a, a beneficiary to pass through the coverage gap into the catastrophic coverage. Um, and, and this was a, a real game changer um, with the ACA. And, and prior to this change, um, ADAP payments were not counted um, in, in helping clients get to um, uh, 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 get into catastrophic coverage with, with lower um, out-of-pocket costs. Um, so the, the short answer is yes. Great. All right, well, to try to keep us to time here, I'm gonna turn it back to Liesl to wrap us up. Great, thanks, Mira. Well, thank you everyone for all those questions and being so engaged um, and joining us today. Please keep your win webinar window open to complete the evaluation when it pops up. And if you haven't already, please sign up for our ACA Center mailing list by going to targethiv.org forward slash ACE. And if you think of any further questions after the session ends today, you can always send us an email with any question for that matter at acacenter at jsi.com. We're happy to be a resource for your healthcare access questions. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, we greatly appreciated um, the, um, all the participation throughout the webinar and hope you have a great afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>